What's cracking, YouTubers? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. Another team outlook coming at you today. We hit the NFC North starting with Green Bay Packers last episode. We're gonna continue in that fashion with the Chicago Bears. Uh, bear stuff, bear stuff, bear stuff, bear stuff. Quickly, just wanna say, guys, the dad hats are for sale. Big dogs gotta eat. If you support your boy, go grab one. They're very limited quantity left. So they're on the site, which will be linked below. Secondly, if you need any fantasy football gear for the season, Fantasy Jocks is the spot. I have an affiliate code link down below. The draft board kit right here has all the player labels in there, really simple. They have championship belts, trophies, rings, all that shit. So yeah, affiliate link down below in the description if you need it. Hope y'all had a fantastic July 4th weekend. I'm still recovering and it's like four days after it, but enough of the plugs, I need the plug. We're back to work. We gotta get back in the fantasy football mindset. So let's get cracking. So the Bears, they pulled off something in this NFL draft, the one for the ages. And I mean that in probably the worst way possible. They traded about 68 picks to move up from the third overall pick to the second overall pick to grab their boy, Mitch Trubisky at a UNC, the quarterback who wasn't going second overall to begin with. I know there was like a lot of rumors about another team trying to trade up, whatever, ridiculousness. Trubisky, everyone knows about the talent, everyone knows about the prospect. He only has 13 games under his belt as a starter at UNC, eight and five, not a great college record, but that happens to a good quarterback sometimes. 6'2", 225, he has that quarterback build. He has a lot of the tangibles and the intangibles that make a great quarterback in the NFL, so obviously it's gonna be process. We're gonna have to see how he pans out. Nonetheless, it was a very, very risky pick, but if the Bears thought they had the franchise quarterback in that pick, then props to the Bears for going after what they believed in. It was very, very possible that Trubisky sits the bench this season. They went out and signed Mike Glennon to a three-year deal, very, very money front-loaded this first year, so they're paying him, it's, it's more so a one-year contract, I would say. They also signed Mark Sanchez. Y'all remember Mike Glennon way back when? He has a really small sample size as well. He had a, well, not a really good, but he had a good rookie year back in 2014. Hasn't really played since. He's been sitting behind Jameis Winston in Tampa Bay. But for some reason, there's always rumors about him getting moved, him getting traded, him getting signed via free agency, and all the money that's gonna come his way. I don't understand how you could pay $16 million to a quarterback that hasn't played in two years, but I digress. They have Mark Sanchez and Trubisky who will battle for the number two spot. Glennon is likely to play that number one role, at least to start the season. If I had to put money, I would say that Trubisky and Mike Lennon both start at least a few games this year. Neither of them are draftable. I wouldn't touch any of them. So I would just stay away from the quarterback situation overall in Chicago. Now, if you think the quarterback situation for the Bears is a mess, then you're in for a nice one with the wide receiver weapons. They got rid of Alshon Jeffrey. We didn't get rid of him. He left via free agency to Philly. Now they're left with a bunch of unknown, a lot of names, a lot of big names, unproven, moderate talents, it's just a lot of random guys that they just kind of threw on the wall and they're gonna see what sticks. Cameron Meredith, Kevin White, Kendall Wright, Marcus Wheaton, Ruben Randall, Victor Cruz, and to be honest with you, at this point, one or two of those guys might not even be on the team anymore, I don't even remember. It's actually really sad when you say that list out loud. So let's start with Kevin White, because he's the big name for a lot of guys, or at least he was last year. I was never a fan of this guy coming out of college. Yeah, I know he ran that ridiculous 40 time. People love him because he looks like a beast at the, at the wide receiver position. Runs like an absolute animal. But that's about as far as it went with him. He's plagued by injuries, hasn't been able to get on the field long enough to show anything. That doesn't mean anything for me. If you're not on the field, you're not able to prove anything, I'm not picking you. This is from Evan Silva at Roto World. Over the last two decades, six first round receivers have caught fewer than 20 passes through their first two NFL seasons. I want you to listen to these names. Yatil Green, RJ Soward, AJ Jenkins, Rashawn Woods, Marcus Nash, and Kevin White. I mean, not the best group to be a part of. I think it's just saying that those first couple years are like huge for your developmental skills and Kevin White has missed those. So I'm, I'm gonna take a hard pass on Kevin White, not even a deep flyer in my books. Going at wide receiver 56, so if you wanted to take the chance, Sure. I'm over to Marcus Wheaton. Somehow stole a contract bigger than, than Brandon Marshall got from the Giants. Bigger than a lot of people got from a lot of places this offseason, which is out of control. So Wheaton's been plagued by injuries a lot of his career. He's already gone 
uh, under the knife, off-season shoulder surgery. He's expected to miss some training camp, some of the off-season program. I'm going to take another hard pass on Wheaton as well as White. Right now as it's set up, it's expected to be Cameron Meredith, who I'll touch on in a second. Y'all know I love Cameron Meredith. Cameron Meredith, Kevin White on the outside, and then battle, I guess, between Victor Cruz and Marcus Wheaton. So when you're done sifting through the rest of the garbage, None of those other guys, I think, are even close to fantasy relevant. We get to Cameron Meredith, who I touched on in my earlier top eight sleeper videos. And I'm so angry that, that he fucked up his hand because he's out six to eight weeks, and I think that's so big. To develop a rapport with the new quarterback, like him and Mike Lennon or him and Trubisky, whoever's under center, I needed Cameron Meredith to have those weeks because he's my boy. So look at it this way. He didn't play a lot in the beginning of the season, but when he did, from week five on last year, he was PPR wide receiver 17 in fantasy. So a legit wide receiver two from week five on. Guy's just 24 years old. He was one of nine wide receivers in the NFL last year to finish as a top 10 fantasy wide receiver in five different weeks. One of nine. So think of, you know, Antonio Brown, Jordy Nelson, Mike Evans, those guys, and Cameron Meredith was in that group. One of nine to finish as a top 10 fantasy wide receiver five different times. And over the last four weeks of the season, he was PPR wide receiver two, only behind Jordy Nelson. It's really not getting talked about enough how good this guy is. And there are a lot of sleeper articles coming out and, and they're creeping his value up a lot, which is annoying, but think about it. He's built just like Alshon Jeffrey, 6'3", 210, really big catch radius, very, very, very athletic, man. I don't want to say their talent is redundant, but I think if he puts together a really nice year, another big year out of him, that might be true. They might have found the next Alshon Jeffrey in Cameron Meredith. There are a couple concerns here. First of all, he's playing in Chicago. The offense is not going to have a lot of scoring opportunities. You don't know who's playing quarterback. And he's missing this key time to develop this chemistry with the new quarterback. I still believe he emerges as the wide receiver one there in Chicago, no doubt in my mind. He's one of my favorite sleepers this year. I think right now he's going at pick. When I wrote this, he was going to pick 111 overall. He's going 86 overall in MFL 10s, which are a good thing to go by, but he's also going 134th overall in FFPC, which is another cash league. He's going around wide receiver 42. They're starting to bake in CBS, ESPN, NFL, and Yahoo ADPs into the ADPs that I look at. So his ADP is way higher right now. He's going around pick 113 when you combine everything together. So if you're playing in like a, a not crazy cash league, you're going to be able to get him for really late as, as like a wide receiver four or five. Just an incredible steal in my opinion. Get Cameron Meredith as a late round sleeper and I have a feeling he's going to have a big, big year. Brings us over to the tight ends. As a pure talent, Zach Miller is a guy who intrigues me. He was on my sleeper list, I think, last year. Or he was on, like, he was in a lot of my videos. I was talking about Zach Miller. I really liked him as a tight end. But since 2014, he just can't stay on the field. He suffered two Liz Frank fractures in his feet. Two different ones since 2014. And the Bears obviously just felt they're, you know, he's not reliable enough to to have just him as a pass catcher and as a tight end in the offense. So they went out and signed Deion Sims, three years, 18 million. Sims is an, is an okay pass catcher, good pass catcher, probably a little bit above um, average. They're gonna be using him a lot as a blocker. That's why they signed him. He did that a lot in Miami and he was good at it. So that's probably why Chicago grabbed him. The Bears, another wild selection for them, took a guy named Adam Sheehan. I'm not sure if you are familiar with him, but he was from a D2 school, Ashland University. Guy's a monster, 6'7", about 280 pounds. They took him 44th, 45th pick overall, so in the second round. He's a former basketball player, always a good thing for these tight ends, of course, just shows their athleticism and the fact that they can move around and, you know, move well. He's just huge. He's a monster. The Bears GM, Ryan Pace, had no problem coming out and saying that he thinks Sheehan's going to play early and often. I particularly think the pick was ridiculous at 45 overall. It's just like a strictly upside pick here. They see a lot of talent. There are so many good players on the board to pick 45 just as an NFL team that I don't think you need to, like you have a lot, you're the Bears. You have a lot of positions to worry about. To fill it in at the tight end with a guy that may or may not pan out, a D2 player that needs to make the jump to the NFL, I don't know, it's a stupid pick in my opinion. Kid's 23 years old, obviously a ton of time to develop. No shot in my mind that we see him be fantasy relevant in 2017. But he's someone definitely to keep an eye on in dynasty leagues because of the upside and the talent that the kid does have. What I will say for the tight end position as a whole is, is this. I'm hoping Zach Miller can make it back because I think he could be a late round tight end, a nice little piece to this puzzle. If you're if you're going, if you're really punting the tight end position, you're looking for a guy later in the draft, Zach Miller will be that guy because he's definitely going undrafted right now. Because when you look back at Mike Lennon's rookie year, he basically pinpointed and targeted only two guys. That was Vincent Jackson 
and that was uh, Tim Wright. So he made Tim Wright a relevant fantasy tight end during his rookie year. So it tells you that he likes using the tight end. He likes using his number one wide receiver. Two upticks, I think, which is good for Cameron Meredith and I guess Zach Miller if he's back. Okay, so we're moving on to the running back position. One of the biggest breakouts of the year, we had Jordan Howard. Probably like the lone bright spot in this Chicago offense in 2016. Going into 2016, Jeremy Langford was that guy, right? Rolled his ankle in, in week four. That's when Jordan Howard became the starter. Jordan Howard was 22 years old. He was a fifth round pick. But from week four to the rest of the season, through the rest of the fantasy season, he was fantasy sixth best running back. He emerged as their three down back. He proved he could do it all. Good size, six foot, about 220 pounds. He averaged over 120 yards from scrimmage in the 11 starts that he had. So just a dynamite season overall for Howard. He was second in the NFL in rushing yards, despite having the 11th most carries. He only had 12 attempts through the first three games and still the second most rushing yards in the NFL. So Howard's going in the top 15 in most drafts you see. It's usually around the end of the, the end of the first round. So between picks like 12 and 18 is where you'll most likely, someone will most likely grab Howard. You're gonna see a lot of debates between Jordan Howard and Jay Ajayi. There are definitely very good points to be made about both, but I will not be taking Jordan Howard in this part of the draft. He, will, he won't be ahead of Jay Ajayi for me. This is why. I will say he, he is gonna be the workhorse in that offense. He'll be a big piece of this offense. And they have a very good run blocking line and they're returning all five starters so great setup for him going into the year my concerns are obviously that he's going to be in the chicago offense how many scoring opportunities is he really going to get my other concern is this they can use jordan howard as a pass catching back they proved that last year he proved it last year but they went out and signed benny cunningham if you remember benny cunningham was the pass catching back in st louis for Gurley when he was healthy and then in the fourth round they picked Tariq uh, Cohen, who has a very similar skill set. He's like a scat back, a guy who's athletic, can catch the ball. So my concern is this, that they're only going to be utilizing Jordan Howard for the most part on the early downs and the goal line work. So you take away, it's almost like a girly situation that I, I believe is going to happen this year. You take away the passing work from a back who has the early down work in a shitty offense, it doesn't leave you with a very high ceiling. And when you're drafting a picks 12, 13, 14, you want a guy that has a really high ceiling. And I just, there's something about Jordan Howard that says to me, you know, don't take him that high because of this stuff. Um, Jeremy Langford and Kadeem Carey are still on the team. Them two will probably battle for a roster spot to kind of back up Jordan Howard as that early down back guy. So they have two pass catchers, two scat backs-ish that'll, that'll play that role behind Howard. Like I said, I, I'd be way more comfortable getting Howard after I know DeMarco Murray, Jay Ajayi, even, I, I think even a lot of people would disagree with me here, but I think there's a good argument between Lamar Miller and Jordan Howard. So I always like to leave with a question. Tell me this, who are you taking? Are you taking Jay Ajayi, Jordan Howard, or DeMarco Murray if all three are on the board? Actually list the order that you have them ranked in. For me, it's DeMarco, Jay Ajayi, which are very close, those two, and then Jordan Howard's below them. So let me know what you think about those three backs. And that's gonna wrap up the video. So if you enjoyed, please just scroll down a little bit, hit the thumbs up so I keep chucking these things out. And subscribe to the channel if you're new, of course. And again, dad hats for sale. If you need a hot dad hat for the summer, we got you stocked on Big Dogs Gotta Eat. And Fantasy Jocks code down below in the description if you need it. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for spending a little bit of your time with your boy. Peace.